You're listening to the Lawyers with Purpose Practice Success Podcast, hosted by Lisa Rozier, featuring attorney Dave Zampano, along with frequent guests. Whether you're a seasoned estate planning attorney, an attorney looking to add estate planning and elder law to your existing list of practice areas, or you're just starting out, this podcast will give you a solid plan for success. Listen now as Dave and his guests share their personal journeys to practice success and the insights they learned along the way. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Practice Success Podcast. I'm Lisa Rocher, joined with Dave Zampano and our special guest today, Michael Rakowski from the Rakowski Law Firm, located in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you guys so much for having me. Awesome, awesome. Uh, there is a visual, isn't it? Bloomfield Hills. Don't you just picture rolling hills with flowers? Yeah. And, it's it's a know. nice place. I'm not going to lie. It's a nice place. Well, that's, that's awesome. Good. That's good. So, Mike, um, Welcome. And, you know, as our listeners know, we always love having guests, um, attorneys that basically share their practice success with us. And um, I always like starting off with just tell our listeners who you are, your journey, and what got you here to your practice yeah. success today. How long, do we have at least two hours today? or? How oh, long? <laughs> well, you know what? I can yeah. tell you, we'll bring you back for a second episode if needed. All right, if there needs to be a part two, there'll be a I'll part I'll pay two. attention to my analytics. I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, perfect, perfect. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Mike Rakowski. Um, I own an estate planning and elder law firm in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, like you guys had mentioned. Um, I've been practicing law now since 2007, started my practice in workers' comp insurance defense, and I was representing insurance companies driving all over the state of Michigan saying, you know, that this person wasn't hurt as much as they said they were trying to prove that, you know, watching like private investigator videos, trials, deposition, the whole thing. And um, it never really sat well with me, but I'm like, you know, I went to law school. Uh, we're going to tough this out and I'm sure I'll figure out something. Then all of a sudden, some of my friends started having kids and they approached me and they said, you know, hey, Mike, you're a lawyer. Like, I, I think I'm supposed to be doing something here. I'm having a kid. Like, what should I be doing? Like a will, something. I'm like, well, you know, I'm a lawyer and there's some forms out there. I can figure this out. And so I started doing a little bit of estate planning and it just like opened my eyes to this, this world of helping people where they actually appreciate what you do, right? Because in the other space, it's like the results never what you wanted. The bill's always too high. Like there's this world that exists where you can help people. They sometimes give you a hug in return in advance, they know what the fee is. And I'm like, this is this is me because I've, I've come to find out that like my passion is just helping people. I love helping people. Whether it's, I run a CrossFit gym out of my garage every morning. It's one of the most rewarding things I do to the work I do in my career. I just like absolutely love helping people. So I to, all that said to say that I started in uh, doing some estate planning at that workers comp firm. And within a couple of years, you know, the partners and I, we kind of talked and it just wasn't aligning with their practice because now all of a sudden they have like people coming in where they had never had a person in their office before. Their office wasn't really set up. There's no reception. Conference rooms were just not a thing. Um, and so we were doing meetings in the office and that was fine. But we, we shortly figured out that, you know, this isn't maybe going to make sense long term. So I would say this was about 2009, 2010, where I branched off on my own. And I'm like, I'm going to give this a go. And, oh. and so I started just right then I was doing what I like to call rent law. I mean, literally, I did some divorce work. I did some contract stuff. I did estate planning as much as I could. I was in every networking group in town. Um, you name it, I was doing it. I was like, you know, immigration, we'll try it. You know, And it just, <laughs> you know, I come to find out pretty quickly that uh, that type of just run around learning new things, it was never very efficient. But um, as we grew, we, we kept the focus on estate planning. Um, and so from about 2011 to about, I would say 2016-ish, I was just focused on revocable living trusts and will planning. That's all I did. And I was using, you know, there's there's systems out there and, and groups to do these kinds of things. You know, I started with a, a software called Four Trust, then Wealth Council, then Elder Council. And um, fast forward to about 2017 
is where I found a group called Lawyers with Purpose. You guys might have heard of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so um, that came out of a very interesting conversation with um, a, an individual who was referring me work. And they said, have you ever heard of Medicaid planning? I'm like, no, like, what is that? You know, all I do is I avoid, I'm a probate avoidance attorney, pretty much is all I do. And so just for some context, by about that point in time, um, I was three, it was a team of three of us. So it was me, a paralegal and another attorney, We're still doing a little bit of rent law, but mostly estate planning. And we had a run rate of, you know, I thought we were doing great by that time. I think we did like 400,000 in revenue for the year. Um, we had one office at that time located in Rochester, and we expanded to another location, which is now the Bloomfield Hills office, because there's this weird line in Michigan that like, it's a highway that like people won't cross. They like, people from Rochester won't go to Bloomfield. People from Bloomfield won't go to Rochester. So like, we're like, let's have like two offices to, to try to tackle a larger area. But anyways, so I found Lawyers with Purpose, which then taught me a couple really important things right out of the gate. One was doing uh, seminars, workshops, whatever you want to call them, public speaking. Let's just call it public speaking. A great way to leverage time, get in front of more people. And there was this problem that I never really recognized um, until I started doing the public speaking that you don't have to, a lot of people know they need general estate planning. They don't know what it is. And they come to you thinking maybe they need something that doesn't fit their goals. Maybe they, they think they need a will, but in reality, they want to do all the things that a trust, for example, would accomplish. And public speaking gave the opportunity to talk to a group of people and get them sort of educated to the point where then they come to you, they, they have a much greater sense of what they need, which then started increasing um, our average retained amount. Although at that time we were tracking zero data. It was literally like, look at the bank account, see how much is in there. Uh, so <laughs> that we, so that's what we call the money in the checkbook rule. So yeah. you got paid the rent law and the money in the checkbook rule. Yeah. The money's yeah. in the checkbook, I'll do it. If the money's not in the checkbook, I won't. Yeah, exactly. So we were definitely using some of those principles at that time. And you know, it was just all the motto of, work harder, you know, the harder you work, the, the, the harder you're going to get paid, exchanging time for money. We can talk about that later. But um, <laughs> so started doing workshops and at right around that time also. So I started with L Lawyers with Purpose. They taught me how to do workshops and they taught me what Medicaid planning was and Medicaid crisis planning, which was then there's a thing out there that has a significantly larger value than what I was originally doing with this using the same skill set, which just became absolutely game changer for us. And also at the same time, we implemented EOS because by the time we opened the two offices, we had about eight or nine employees. They were split between the two offices and I'm running back and forth like a chicken with my head cut off, trying to like manage this thing I call a law practice. That is that I'm working for. It's not working for me. Does Ooh, that that's a good one. It was managing you. You were oh, managing it was, you. Yeah. It was, it, was ruining, that. it was ruining my life. But this is this is where everything starts to get better. So now I'm part of this group, Lawyers with Purpose, that has a community of people that you can lean on to, to learn new things. It itself has an incredible platform to teach you how to do different things better. And so now all of a sudden I've layered on workshops. Um, we went from pre lawyers of purpose. We were at about 500,000 run rate to within two years, we went from 500,000 to 1.9 thousand, uh, 1.9 million. Wow. So we grew, I don't know, what's the math on that? I'm terrible at math four times, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and so that was just absolutely game changer. And what I noticed, what I started to notice was with the in-person workshops, there became this repeatable metric that I wasn't even tracking data at the time, but I could just say that, you know, if I spent this, did this amount of workshops, this amount of people would show up, about this amount of people would sign up for a meeting, and this amount of people would retain my services. And it was almost incredible math to the like one or two percent that this is just a repeatable thing. And 
you know, you think like, how is that possible? All different people, different walks of life, whatever. It just, it, it is what it is. And so we ran that model through 20, through the pandemic. And um, at that point we hadn't broken 2 million, but it's, we had some other problems. This is where like EOS had really helped us to start looking at data. So now we have something called a scorecard where we're looking yeah. at things like, how often is the phone ringing? Of the amount of times the phone rings, how many is uh, how many are a qualified lead that would then book an appointment? Of the booked appointments, how many are showing up for meetings, retaining our services? You get the idea. It's like yeah. this. This ends up being the more data you have, it ends up being a big math problem. And it's like you want to lay around a million dollars of revenue. Just do the math problem. Just do the math. Uh, Mike, I got to stop you here because you have just filled a five gallon bucket with about 25 gallons of stuff. <laughs> and I want to I'm, I peel it back. I want to peel it back yeah. because when I'm thinking about yeah. someone listening to this podcast, it could be somebody who is maybe using Fortrust or some of these other organizations. It could be somebody who's an LDP. It could be somebody that doesn't know any of them. Yeah. Um, what I want to unpeel is a couple things. So I want to just repeat what you said in a different way. So the first thing I'm hearing you say is that that shift from using a document creation centered organization to a law practice management uh, organization really was right, a shift. Pause. So, yeah, you have to we gotta stop. And pause, pause. Your, your audio, your Wi-Fi is not strong, so you can't say that again. You came out funny, so start oh, again. One part. All right, so I'll just start that whole piece hey, over. Dave, Dave, I would just kill your video if we're not using this for video at all. That okay. way it's clear. You know, I didn't want to deny you seeing this beautiful Oh, face. no, I got you now. Yeah, so all right. So I'll just start that over. So, so yep. you got the part where I said 25-gallon bucket and yep. that part. All right, yep. so, so to kind of restate that is... You had, you started your practice with documents. How do I create a legal document, a trust versus a will? And then, you know, we, we get into this pattern of who's got, do I know the legal work? Do I know the legal work? Can I produce the documents? But I think the final shift you made where you saw your most growth is when you understood that doing those documents translates to running a law practice. How do we use our legal knowledge? And, and here, what I've always taught here and everywhere is, number one is you have to have legal knowledge because that legal knowledge generates what we call offerings, what you can offer. Like you said, Medicaid crisis planning versus Medicaid pre-planning. There's a lot of attorneys that do crisis planning, but say, I can't do pre-planning. Well, can you do both? Absolutely, you can do both. How do you do that? Then offerings equals what people can hire you for, but they can't hire you if they don't know you're there. So that's where you go out and you market to drive people, like you said, to a workshop, yep. which then gives you an audience to drive people in or out, right? That's an efficiency tool. But what I love what you said is the next is really it's about practice management, not about the documents. Look, at the end of the day, we all got to have documents. But how do we get somebody from that workshop to the vision meeting where they're going to choose to hire us or not? And what's the value proposition we can show them? So there's two elements. We got to be able to show our value, right? So we have to know our value. That's our legal services we offer. We got to show our value. So we got to have people know that we're there. So they call us. And then we got to show our value to individually. So they know what the value is of hiring us. So they hire us. So that's that value proposition we talk about. And then we have to deliver our value, right? Delivering our value is a point where you were talking about the two offices, right? Running between. Delivering your values about your operations. How do you run your operations? How are people inside the office communicating? How are your finances coordinating with your, your paraprofessionals, right? And, and how is all this working together in the metrics? Like you said, all of these metrics, the beautiful part is you, you said in 2010, you went out on your own. My, my head rang because that was Michael Gerber, right? You had your entrepreneurial seizure. That's yeah. what Michael Gerber talked about in the email. And, and so what I thought about is the entrepreneurial seizure law school taught us all how to practice law. It didn't tell us how to run a law practice, right? And so that's the big shift I see in your story is that you began understanding while EOS was a mechanism to guide you, the systems and processes are still the things tracking the metrics. And what I love about what you said, Michael, because most people don't appreciate this because they say it's not possible. 
isn't it nice to know by the first of the month what your revenue is going to be at the end of the month? <laughs> and, and, and you know that because of systemizations, like you said, you know the metrics that if you spend X amount of dollars, you generate Y amount of leads. If you get Y amount of leads, you get Z amount of attendees. And that Z amount of attendees equals A amount of hires at an average rate of B amount of dollars. And when you do that metrics, now you can refine all those elements. And by the way, Michael, this whole conversation that you threw 20 gallons of stuff in a five gallon bucket is what we call the practice of law. It's running the law practice. So the law practice that run you. So thanks. I just wanted to reflect that because your insights are incredible. They were a, a, tra a traditional story of that transformation from lawyers, I think, and I'd love your feedback on this because you work with a lot of lawyers and you've talked about our great community, but lawyers think that their knowledge is where it's at. And that is where it's at, but that's only the first step, right? It's know your value, then show your value both to the public so they come in and to the individual so they hire you, deliver your value, right? So that you can actually give them the thing they heard for. And number four is grow your value and that's by your team and culture. And that's what you've done, Michael. So I'd love you to talk about that and just share some comments about my thoughts. Push back a little, tell me where you see it different, where you see it the same, so that those that are anywhere in that process kind of know what's ahead of them and maybe what they can appreciate some of the progress they've made. Yeah, yeah, no, the, yeah, that, thank you for the recap because it was uh, 25 gallons there. Um, all right, so I was me, following the whole entire time. So we, out there. I'll just keep <laughs> pouring on the gallon. So let's go 50 for, for five again. I love it. Uh, okay. So, so yes, uh, one thing that you pointed out that I uh, attribute a lot of my success to, and I think it takes lawyers a long time to get here is that we are just running businesses, right? Like we have all the same things that any business out there has sales, marketing, processes, uh, you know, all of it. it. It's exactly the same. And us lawyers, I, can, I get to say this because I am one, right? And so are you. Uh, it, we all think that we are so smart and our intelligence is what is going to bring clients in the door. Like, right, you just hang up your shingle outside and all of a sudden everyone's just going to run in because, oh my gosh, there is this smart attorney that hung up their shingle at 111 Main Street, right? And, and that's not how it works at all. Um, that is actually the, 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 maybe the easiest part is like having the knowledge to do because you can lean on a community when you don't know, like you don't have to know all the answers, but all those other pieces of, of everything that you talked about is what's going to get people in the door. They're gonna, you know, they have to build trust in you, see your value. You have to deliver on the value. So, you know, making sure you're not dropping any balls anywhere and that's your process is. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day in estate planning, most people are not going to know that anything you did for them works until they can't know that it worked or not. Right. So right. Right. So I could just hand yeah. them a stack of papers and they're just how much trust do they have in me? that whatever I agreed to do for them is actually going to work. I mean, you know, as attorneys, how often have we reviewed some other attorney's work and we're like, oh, we could have done that better or different or whatever. Um, so we're in a very unique position that we have to build so much trust through other things we do like processes and systems and how is, and, and we're being judged every moment of every day. How was the phone answered? How quickly was my, my phone call returned? All of those things. And we have to be very mindful of, of that more well, so I, than do we know. I think you rule? just set up, my friend, uh, an invitation to a second call because I think, you know, the fact, and again, I wasn't even aware of this myself, Michael, because I, I haven't really worked a lot with you hands on as I have some of the other members, but I didn't realize you had such growth in the first two years and now you're progressing. So in our model, we call that a uh, profitable model to robust. And then from robust to e-freedom. So you're like, you're in, you're in what we would call heavy robust. You've got a robust practice. You're growing, you're growing. The final level for you to discover at some point is what we call entrepreneurial freedom, which means the law of practice runs without you and grows without you. Now, what it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're going to return. It means you focus only on the things you love doing most and that you're most effective at, right? That's what we call e-freedom. 
I would love to have you back if you would accept the invitation, because I think people would love to hear from you more, not from me, about, you know, what were some of the challenges in transitioning from 500000 to $2 million, from going from a work hard and get the money in the checkbook to a more system-oriented, uh, data-oriented, uh, as you said, dashboard, the LWP dashboard to profitability. How do we look at these dashboards and make numbers make sense to us proactively rather than reactively? You think that would be a great conversation? I'd be happy to join again. Look at that, Lisa. I, so I, I would it. love to invite Michael cool. back. I think, but we'll focus, Lisa, on the next call about that transition because I got to tell you, it's hard for lawyers, Michael. And again, I'm a bit, you know, my whole story started when I read the E-Myth in 1999 and uh, that changed everything, but I didn't read it. I started to live it and you did. I mean, luckily you had other people that had already built the systems that you had to just implement. But I would propose it's just as hard to implement systems as it is to build them because oh. it requires a change in mindset. Really? And it requires a change in culture, how you people, how the staff all work together. Look, well, when you're one or two or three people, it's, you all talk to each other. When you're six, seven, eight, or nine, there's huge pockets of miscommunication, and that's where systems become critical. And again, starting with those foundations, that's, I think, a great topic for another conversation. Love and it. I agree. And, and I want to, we will come back and we will have this conversation. But just for our listeners, um, how is your how are you structured right now, Michael? You and I were talking about this before we started, but I think it's interesting and it'll and it'll make people be like, oh, how did that happen? Talk to me about your office locations and how you're operating yeah. right now. Yeah, so real quick, um pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, we were five offices spread out all over Michigan, running six to ten workshops a month, and that was just what we did. We also had professional relationships and those kinds of things feeding us. Pandemic hits. We pivoted quickly to a virtual model and the team just absolutely loves it. So we are still virtual with absolutely no plans of ever going back. We have employees now in Colorado, Texas, the UP, Florida. We're half out of state virtual and half in state. It's absolutely incredible. That's and the power of systems, my friend. Yeah. yeah. That, that's amazing. I hope we can talk more about that in our next episode. We'll talk about that next because you're not the only firm. We have several of our firms that have done that. In fact, really funny, quick story in our community. You just saw a post on a listserv. One of our key members had a um, drafting coordinator they've had for many years that they just realized it was time for them to separate. And he said, look, anyone in the organization that would need a draft of this person is awesome. And she is. She did manuals and everything. And there was many other attorneys not in that same state that were talking to her about joining because again we live in a very close world now everybody's a click away yeah, yeah. And then that's yeah all right well michael thank you so much i so appreciate your input i love your energy i love your success i'm i'd like to hear the hard part of it in the next one and we'll, and uh i think our members will be looking forward to it yeah right. absolutely my, my goal is my goal is for a third invite Oh, all right. I love it. I'm always up for a challenge. I'm always up for a a challenge. Very good idea. You know what? Here's my proposition, Michael. I think we could do three invites. And here's what I would say. Number two will be about the the challenge to build the practice. And then number three will be about what's the ultimate prize. That's what we call e-freedom. What's your version of e-freedom? I would love to do that in episode three. What do you say? Love it. Let's go. Okay. So with that being said, our listeners out there, again, this is Michael Rakowski, who we are talking with from the the Rakowski Law Firm out of Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And Michael, if anybody wants to reach out to you, connect with you, how how would you like them to connect? Oh, sure. Uh, You can email me. That'd probably be best. It's uh, mlr at rutkowskilawfirm.com. You could just go to our website as well, rutkowskilawfirm.com. That's spelled R-U-T-K-O-W-S-K-I lawfirm.com. Fill out the contact us form and just say, you know, you got a question for me or whatever. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you again. And um, for our listeners, you will be hearing Michael again and have a wonderful day. And remember, if you want to hear additional stories about other uh, attorneys with practice success, just go to lawyerswithpurpose.com and click on the practice success podcast button. Or if you want to share your stories of success, whether you're a member or not, we'd love to hear them. Yes. Uh, Click there and we'll love to get you on the show. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Practice Success Podcast. Visit www.lawyerswithpurpose.com podcast to listen to other episodes and to subscribe. We'll see you next time.